Yeah, next to the data set, to having good quality data, one of the aspects that determines the success of applying convolutional networks to computer vision problems is choosing the right architecture. So in this video, I want to briefly go over some of the most popular architectures out there, but it will be only a very brief overview because the next lecture will be wholly dedicated to CNN architecture. So here, this will be the big picture. In the next lecture, we will dive in and I will explain some of these architectures in more detail. And also here in this video, uh, I want to add one more thing that we haven't talked about yet. And that is how we work with multiple color channels. So, so far we only worked with black and white images, the um, uh, MNIST images where we used the Lynette architecture. Now we are also going to look at other architectures that can work with color and I will explain you how that works. So but let's start um, with this traditional architecture here. So one traditional architecture you already saw was the Lynette 5 architecture which was applied to handwritten digit recognition or yeah, in general handwriting recognition. and. CNNs have been used then or since then a couple of times, but they were not they were not really that popular. I mean, uh, traditional con uh, computer vision approaches were usually faster and gave better accuracy results. And there was a so-called ImageNet competition. I think um, I'm not sure if it was in recent years, but it has been a very popular competition once where people tried out different computer vision approaches to classify. Yeah, uh, images in this data set. It's a very large data set consisting of millions of images. And usually traditional computer vision outperformed these convolutional networks or other neural networks. And what was now big here in 2012 is that for the first time, a, a convolutional network really outperformed anything else. So any other type of computer vision approach was really outperformed in this year by a large margin. And that is really when people paid or started to pay more attention to uh, deep neural networks and convolutional networks. So essentially this AlexNet architecture, which is shown here, was the main breakthrough for CNNs and also maybe for deep learning in general. So in particular, this AlexNet achieved a 15.4% error, the top five error. I will explain on the next slide um, yeah, the top five error or top five accuracy, how that is defined again. But yeah, in any case, um, Focus now on the number 15.4 as the error here. And in comparison, the best or second best method, the second best was not even close. So the second best method was, I think, a traditional computer vision method. And it was like around 26.2% error. So you can see it was almost twice as good as anything else out there. And that is really when people yeah, uh, paid more attention to deep learning and convolutional network. And that is really when it started to take off um, but yeah, also nowadays, I mean, 15.4% that would be actually pretty bad. Nowadays, you can, um, using the right architecture, achieve even a top five error of only 3%. So besides having many layers here in this architecture, I will also actually show you a better, or well, not better, but a simpler illustration on the next slide. But instead of having um, multiple layers, one of the novelties here was also that the authors Alexander Krzyzewski, Sutzgeber, and Hinton, um, that they used um, GPUs in a very effective way. So I think back then um, GPUs were pretty small still regarding the memory. So here what they did is they split the work into like a two parallel processing steps. So you can see this is here the input image. It's uh, I think 20, 224 times 224 and they split it into two parts. So one is this upper part and one is the lower part where they kind of processed things um, separately. Sometimes there was some communication between those. But um, yeah, these were um, largely run in parallel to really make things faster. And then in the end, um, the results were concatenated into a fully connected layer. And that one was then, yeah, uh, attached to that one was then the output layer. I think this might actually be the output layer, sorry. So here, this is the last, that is the last um, layer before the output layer. So the output layer is essentially this whole thing here from 4096 to 1000, 
where the 1000 are the number of classes here. So yeah, here is a simpler visualization of the same architecture, except that it is now on a single GPU. It's usually how we would nowadays train a LXNet. And we will also do that later in this lecture. I'll have a implementation of that that I will show you. So what we can see here, see here is the first feature map. So the input image would be actually here, the 224 times 224 input image. And we have three color channels. And I will also explain to you at the end of this video how we work with different color channels. So the first feature map has then 96 channels, then 256 channels, then 386, and then 384. Actually, I think this is a typo here. I think this should be also 384. Um, if we look back uh, on the previous slide, they had 192 plus 192 from the two GPUs, which should be 384. So in that way, I think it was a minor typo. But honestly, in practice, it would not matter much whether it's two or two more or two fewer channels. It, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, and then 256 channels. And then they reshape this one into a long vector with 4096 activations. I will also show you in the code how that works. It's actually pretty simple to do using a reshape. And then this is a fully connected layer here. And this is the output layer. So we have 1000 classes. And here, this is essentially like a multi-layer perceptron. Again, uh, if this looks a little bit abstract, we will see in the code example how that looks like in PyTorch. And sometimes I think it's easier to look at it actually in PyTorch because it, so PyTorch is such a yeah, easy to use library in terms of the multi-layer perceptron and convolutional network implementations that sometimes just looking at the model there can even be simpler than looking at the images here. Yeah, so here is the snapshot of the ImageNet data set to which the LXNet was applied to. And uh, I will actually zoom in into that on the next slide. Another interesting aspect here I just wanted to highlight, it's also from the same paper, is that they looked at these different yeah, kernels of the network at different stages during training. And also what was interesting is yeah the types of um, kernels that were learned. So some are essentially edge detector. So these are essentially things for detecting vertical or diagonal edges. I will actually zoom into that or discuss this in the next video, what that actually means and how this can be interpreted. So, but yeah, let's zoom in on the ImageNet here. So ImageNet, um, that was or is still a very popular data set consisting of 1.2 million images and 1,000 classes. And if you recall, I'm not sure if you actually watched those, but the stuff in the news videos that I optionally make, you don't have to watch those. But uh, in these videos, I had an example, a recent research effort where people yeah, started to clean up ImageNet because sometimes there can be multiple objects. I just see there is such a case here. For instance, we have a motor scooter here. But there's also a car. So yeah, um, predicting car wouldn't be wrong either. But this la label here, the only correct label for this image is motor scooter because each image has only one label here. So in this case, yeah, some people try to yeah, clean up ImageNet. Or here, for instance, we have cherries and a dog. So it's actually not so simple to make a prediction sometimes because um, yeah, there are multiple possibilities, but if you're only given one class label, your network might be predicting the right thing, but uh, it's different from what the label says. So let me see. So yeah, for example, another, yeah, one example would be actually this cherry example. So how this accuracy, stepping a step back, how this accuracy is measured, it's the so-called top five performance or top five accuracy. And it is essentially if the correct prediction is, um, in, so the label is among the top five predictions of the model. So if you recall how the softmax function works, it's essentially class membership probabilities. So we have a softmax activation vector consisting of 1000 class membership probabilities. So here people look at the five largest probabilities and get the class labels for those. And these are listed here. So and these bars represents the confidence for each of the classes. So here, 
let's focus in on, on this image again. So the five classes that the network returns is Dalmatian, Grape, Elderberry, Fortshire, Bull Terrier, and Current. So we can see though that, so this would be actually counted as a misclassification because the most confident label is Dalmatian, although in truth it's a cherry. So you can see it's actually might be even impossible to get 100% accuracy in the first place. There are some images that are a little bit tricky. Um, let's take a, take a look at another one, this here, this car. So here the true label is grill and the network predicts or the five most confidence, uh, confident predictions are convertible, grill, pickup, beach wagon and fire engine. I would say actually, so the most confident prediction is convertible for this network. I would say this is this is correct, right? So we this is indeed convertible. But yeah, grill is another prediction by the network and here this is counted as a correct classification because even though it's only the second most confident predictions, it's among the top five and the top five matches this image here. So yeah, it's it's a little bit tricky to evaluate on this image data set, but um, just wanted to explain to you how the accuracy is computed. In any case, so this is how the ImageNet dataset looks like. And yeah, AlexNet at that time was really a breakthrough for image classification measured on this dataset. Yeah, and it's also worth pointing out what the input size is again. So they took original images, downsampled them to 256 to 256, and then produced random crops. And the input images to the network were then essentially 224 times 224. Even if it sounds like 224 times 224 is not much, uh, like in common standards, if you think of your cell phone where you have millions of pixels, so 224 times 224 plus or times the three color channels, it's actually pretty small. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, if you think of a neural network, for instance, a multi-layer perceptron that takes all these inputs and you have a fully connected layer, this is still, I mean, 150,528 features that we have here as input. So this is something that wouldn't be really manageable by any other machine learning technique. For instance, uh, a multi-layer perceptron would really choke on such large inputs. And also other methods um, uh, like gradient boosting or random forests or yeah, anything basically. So it's actually, even though it doesn't look like it, a 24, 224 times 224, it's actually a pretty large input. All right, so talking about the CNN architectures, I will, like I promised, dive into more detail in the next lecture. But here is just a brief overview. So here are different architectures from a paper that goes back to 2016. There are nowadays more architectures, new architectures that are not included here, for example, mobile net and dense net and um, others. But still, it's a very nice summary of the most popular ones here. And I also like this uh, visualization. So maybe let's let's take a look at the left one here first, the top one accuracy that's on ImageNet. So we discussed before top one accuracy may be a little bit problematic, but yeah, that's what we have here. Um, what's interesting really is like just having a reference to all these architectures in, in one slide essentially. So there's the AlexNet, there's a, I think BN means with batch norm, any NIN is a network in network. I will also talk about this next lecture, the Google Net, ResNet. ResNet, I would say, is maybe still the most popular architecture. It's a certain type of architecture using residual connections. It's a very yeah, important concept that we will talk about next week. Uh, VGG and so forth, the Inception Network. I'm planning to talk about some of them, not all of them, but yeah, let's maybe take uh, NIN. ResNet, VGG, and Inception as the ones. So to keep it manageable, these are yeah among the most popular ones. So here, they are showing just the accuracy. Here on the right hand side, this is slightly more interesting. It's also looking at the parameter size. So here is like the legend for the parameter size, the number of parameters, like from five million to. 155 million. So you can see, AlexNet is approximately, I would say. Yeah, somewhere maybe around 65 million. And then we have something like a VGG, which is 
155 million parameters approximately. And you can see there are other networks, for example, I think this is Inception version 4, which has only maybe 35 million. And even though it doesn't have more parameters than VGG, it has a better accuracy. So more parameters doesn't mean necessarily better accuracy. You can see LXNet has actually more parameters than any one of these. Still, the accuracy is much lower. So ResNet, for instance, with the residual connections, yeah, can actually boost the accuracy. Or Inception has an auxiliary loss, for instance, that can also be helpful. In any case, this is yeah the brief overview, so you know there are many different types of architectures, and LXNet is only one of them. It's actually here also at the low end in terms of the top-run accuracy, so we will talk about much better uh, models in the next lecture. But I think LXNet is still a nice introduction to the topic of convolutional networks, and I will also, of course, show you a code example using LXNet at the uh, end of this lecture. Oh yeah, one more important aspect to talk about is how we work with color channels. In the beginning of this lecture, we introduced yeah, the Lynette architecture, which was just working with black and white images, which only have one color channel. But yeah, LXNet, for instance, works, works with um, ImageNet, which is in color. We have color images. So how do we deal with that? So yeah, let me explain it maybe step by step. So maybe focus now only on the thing I'm framing here right now, that is one color channel. It's called it R. And previously what we did is we used a kernel for that that was just like a matrix, a M by M matrix, like this. And then, yeah, we applied the convolution. So we were sliding this over the image and then computing um, the feature maps here. So one or the kernel applied to one receptive field yields one pixel in the feature map here. Okay, now what we have is we have multiple color images. So for instance, let's say we have RG, the RGB format, red, green, blue. So we have also now a green color channel and a blue color channel. So this is our input image here. The whole thing here is our input image. And then corresponding to this input image, we also have a kernel that has the same number of channels. So notice now we also, our kernel has three channels. And we apply each kernel layer or each kernel channel only to the corresponding channel in the input image. So red goes with red, green goes with green, and blue goes with blue. It's a regular convolution. And then once we computed that, we sum over these channels. So the kernel and the input is a matrix, uh, sorry, element-wise multiplication and a sum. Right, so it's just like the regular convolution, but then we are summing, after that we are summing over the channels C in. So that's the input channels, we are summing over them. And this whole thing here, everything that's going on here, this will give us one feature map. So this whole thing results in one feature map. So how do we get multiple feature maps? That's essentially an extension of what we talked about earlier. We would just use multiple kernels. So we have here kernel k1, kernel k2, kernel k3, kernel k4, kernel k5. And each kernel will produce one feature map. So here, um, I don't have really many colors left here. So this one will, for instance, then produce this uh, feature map. and. This one will produce this feature map and so forth. So that's how we get the different feature maps. And yeah, this is essentially it. So here at the bottom, just yeah, highlighting again, the input image is n times n times c in. And in PyTorch, usually we have another dimension. So we have n as the number of images in the batch, c as the channels, W is the width and H is the height. Sometimes people use this format. 
uh, where you have the number of images, the width, height, and the channel last, but that's just a minor detail. Um, you don't really have to worry about this here in this slide. And in the yeah, in the next video, we will briefly talk about what is seen and can see, and then we will finally get to the code implementation.